Hello, everyone. We welcome you to the Human Cell Atlas Biological Networks Seminar. Today, we're focus focusing on technology, and we are going to talk about the advances in spa spatial omics. Uh, I would like to remind you to join the Human Cell Atlas uh, by navigating to our website. Uh, we have 18 biological networks. You can become a member of one or many, depending on your interests. Uh, we want to remind you also to submit your papers for inclusion as an HCA publication. Uh, if you follow the link, it will explain the process to you. Um, this could help uh, your paper gain more visibility. Um, also be tuned for our upcoming HCA events. We have a HCA general meeting that we're looking forward to in July in Toronto. It's a hybrid meeting. Um, I think the uh, in-person participation is now closed, but the virtual is still ongoing. So please visit our website and um, join. We are hoping to see you all in the summer. Uh, we are looking forward to the Middle East introduction to HCA symposium in the fall. Stay tuned to the details um, by visiting our website often. The HCA Latin America Computational Workshop will take place in October in Santiago. Uh, it's open to the Latin American participants. Uh, also stay tuned for more details. And the HCA Asia annual meeting this year is in Kolkata, India in November. Um, so today's seminar agenda is pretty packed. We have um, quite a few speakers. Uh, we're delighted to welcome the, them all and Dorit and Holger will um, introduce them in a second. Um, oops. So let me uh, actually introduce our moderators today. Uh, Orit, uh, Rosenblatt Rosen and Holger Hein are the co-chairs of the HCA uh, Standard and Technology Working Group. Uh, Orit is the head of the cell and tissue genomics department at Genentech. She's a pioneer in single cell genomics technologies and their applications to tissues to better understand health and disease. Um, Previously, she was the scientific director of the Klarman Cell Observatory at the Broad Institute at MIT and Harvard, where she focused on deciphering cellular and tissue circuits. She co-leads the HCA Standards and Technology Working Group. And Holger is a leader of the single cell genomics team at the Spanish National Center for Genomics Analysis. His group combines technology development with research activities that center on Atlas projects and immune oncology. Uh, as they introduce our speakers, and as you hear the uh, talks, please feel free to submit your questions in the Q&A section of Zoom, and they will be um, answered either in writing by the speakers or at the end uh, during the discussion section. And uh, Orit and Holger, thank you for joining us today and thank you for leading today and welcome. Thank you so much, Ellen. Uh, Holger and I are really delighted to chair this bio network webinar and we have a fantastic lineup of speakers today. Our first speakers are Lisa McGinnis and Alma Anderson, and let me introduce them. So Lisa McGinnis is a physician scientist and group lead at Genentech, where she leads the Spatial Omics Lab. Prior to joining Genentech, Lisa received her MD-PhD from Stanford University and completed her postdoc in Will Greenleaf's lab, where she uh, used novel single cell technologies to characterize human leukemias. Currently at Genentech, she's interested in developing and deploying novel spatial technologies to answer interesting biological and clinical questions. Um, Alma is a senior AI scientist at Genentech's AI ML department. Before she joined Genentech, she did her PhD in Joachim Lundberg's lab, where she focused on method development for analysis of spatial transcriptomics data. Alma's current research interests still encompass spatial omics method development, as well as more fundamental machine learning topics. And today, Lisa and Alma will speak about how they employ new technologies to interrogate the biology of TLS, of tumor-associated TLS structures. Alma and um, Lisa, take it away. Um, thank you so much, Orit and Ellen, for inviting us. 
Um, today, we're going to be talking about using some of these novel technologies in the spatial world to interrogate the biology of tumor-associated tertiary lymphoid structures. Um, tertiary lymphoid structures, or TLSs, are really just organized aggregates of different immune cells. So when we think about this, you can see the cartoon here on the left. You can see B cells, T cells, dendritic cells, but you also, really importantly, have resident stromal cells. And by that, I mean fibroblast, endothelial cells, um, stromal cells. And these organized um, lymphoid structures form in non-lymphoid tissues. And by this, I mean not lymph nodes, not lymph nodes, not the spleen. And this can happen either in the setting of chronic inflammatory diseases or in neoplastic diseases. Um, and you can see this example in, on the right where we have a MIBI image of a TLS and non-small cell lung carcinoma. And these are particularly interesting to us because the TLS presence in tumors have emerged as a prognostic correlate of improved patient survival when treated with um, immunotherapies. And you can see that down in the charts below, where when patients are treated with anti-CTLA-4, patients that have a high TLS signature have improved sur overall survival. And this is also shown when patients are treated with anti-PD-1. Patients with a higher intermediate TLS signature, as shown by gene expression, have improved overall survival. So this has been really interesting in that how are these TLSs correlating with this Im improved response? And so we were really interested in trying to identify mechanisms of how TLSs are induced and how do they mature. Um, and by this, I mean that when no TLSs are present, we have what we call kind of a diffuse or sometimes even just scattered um, lymphoid cells. And you can see that over on the left-hand side of this um, trajectory. However, at some point, these TLSs will get induced. There's a signal to start um, causing lymphoid cells to aggregate together in tissues, um, informing either lymphoid aggregates or immature TLSs. And you can see that in the middle panel here. So we have an organized aggregate, but no germinal center. Um, and then um, subsequently after maturation, you can see mature TLSs form. And that's shown all the way on the right here, where we have this beautiful germinal center present with a ring of immune cells around it. And so what we wanted to do was employ some of these high resolution spatial technologies so that we could really better understand and characterize the cellular makeup of these organized structures and hopefully understand some of the interactions between different TLS states um, in humans to kind of understand their contribution to anti-tumor immunity. And this is really a wonderful time to try and understand TLSs because we really have this evolving toolbox of spatial omic technologies. And you can see here on this slide that um, we have both an explosion of spatial transcriptomic technologies and spatial proteomic technologies. Um, and one of the things I think is most powerful about this as a pathologist is the correlation we can make between histology and the morphologic uh, features that we find in tissues and their transcriptional state. And one of the questions we often get in my lab is why do we need so many different spatial omic tools? Um, and often I answer people by saying each one of these tools is really uniquely situated to answer different types of questions. And you can see that on the graph below in which we have features. And by this, I mean either genes or proteins on the y-axis and the tissue area profiled on the, on the x-axis. And so certain technologies such as geomics or um, visium um, sits up here in the upper left-hand corner in which you're measuring lots of different features. It's a whole trend transcriptome at measurement, but really we're not able to profile as much of the tissue. It's a, it's a subset, either an FOV or a subset of the slide. However, if you go over to the right-hand side of this, in which you have technologies such as Cosmix SMI or Zinium, we're able to measure fewer fewer features. These are targeted panels, um, sometimes a thousand or even less than a thousand, but we're really able to get a whole slide image. Um, and this is really important, and Alma will talk about this in, in the second half of this presentation, why this upper left hand or upper right hand corner of the slide is so interesting, and in that it gives us enough um, transcriptional information, not only to identify cells, but to ask what they're doing. And it also gives us enough, um, enough uh, area of the slide to say what repeating patterns or spatial niches can we observe. And so today we're really going to be focusing on the um, cosmic spatial molecular imager, which um, as shown here, this is a technology that in which you have um, RNA probes that uh, you have probes that bind to the RNA, and then you have cyclic imaging so that eventually you get a readout of 16 different sets of reporters. Um, and you can see the raw images in the middle panel here. We identify then those transcripts and where they're located in XYZ space, segment the cells, and then assign these transcripts to different cells. 
And so we use this technology as part of a larger project to characterize TLSs, as I mentioned previously. So TLS is a relatively rare and non-small cell lung carcinoma. And so we um, reviewed over 200 different specimens with five pathologists to look for um, specimens that were enriched in either lymphoid aggregates or mature TLSs. And you can see an example of this um, down at the bottom here, where every single box is around either a lymphoid aggregate or a TLS or a diffuse sort of infiltrate. We then performed consensus annotations across the entire slide with five different pathologists to characterize every single one of these slides. sites. Um, we then performed a different stack of different technologies. Today, I'm really going to be focusing on the COSMICS technology. And you can see an example of this um, information shown here, um, where we see just the gene expression values and where they are in space. But we also really clear, um, Keely um, did 10x flex on this on all of these blocks so that we could also get a single cell picture um, of all these different all these different um, specimens. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to Alma to talk about how we've used these different types of information. Thank you, Lisa. That was an excellent overview of the different spatial mix techniques and their different pros and cons. And so I guess what I wanted to do here was just to take a step back and focus a bit on what it takes to go from the experimental data to these nice UMAP embeddings or these spatial distribution plots that you uh, showed before. And so I wanted to start by just addressing sort of like this idea of single cell data, right? Because that's a fairly more established technique than spatial omics. It's been around for slightly longer. And we have to some extent a fairly sort of like standardized pipeline. Of course, the different elements in this pipeline for the analysis varies to some extent, depending on your question, but they are more or less uh, different variants of these three blocks here, where we have like a first QC and normalization step, maybe some batch correction as well. Then we tend to do some dimensionality reduction and maybe some clustering. And this is all in order to answer some and questions where one of these questions is very typically at least what are you with respect to the different cells such as are you a macrophage is this cell a neutrophil is it a b cell or a t cell or any other cell type that might be present in your tissue and so even though the experimental techniques for single cell and spatial omics varies to some extent we can like represent the different modalities very similarly computationally so one thing that we can do and that a lot of people has done is to essentially just take this single cell analysis pipeline and apply it to our spatial omics data and that would allow us to answer still this question of what are you for example a macrophage but since the spatial data have spatial information enco encoded within it we can also address this question of where are you we can say you're a macrophage at location x and y or you're a neutrophil at location x and why. And that is super informative just by itself, because now all of a sudden we can like add context to our data and we can speak about cell cell adjacencies, adjacencies for example. However, even though spatial omics data and single cell data is similar, they're not identical. And we can actually be a bit more clever about this and actually try to develop something that's akin to like a spatial omics pipeline. And with that, I kind of like mean that we try to introduce this idea of spatially aware methods, such as, for example, a spatially aware dimensionality reduction step or a spatially aware clustering step. And that would allow us to give a better or like enhanced answer to this where question. Instead of just saying you're a macrophage at location X and Y, we can say you're a macrophage in an immune infiltrate, or maybe you're a neutrophil in an immune infiltrate, or a neutrophil in a TLS site. And so that's actually what I wanted to speak a bit more about today in this sort of like idea of spatially aware methods. And so to sort of like illustrate this, I wanted to give an example of this tonsil data, and we're soon going to come back to the TLS data, but I think this is a pretty illustrative example. And there's quite a lot of stuff happening in this slide, so I'm going to try to guide you through it. So to the very uh, leftmost part here, you see an H&E image of a serial section to a tissue that we did cosmics on, or that Liz and her team did cosmics on. I didn't really do the cosmics part. Uh, and then in the mid part here, you have sort of like this cosmics data represented in two different ways. And the first way where it's sort of like standard SE method, when sort of like non-spatially aware, uh, we use uh, one of these sort of like standard single cell methods scrapped from the single cell analysis pipeline, and that allows us to identify these different phenotypes. For example, whether a cell is a T cell or a B cell. Then if we look at the second representation here of the cosmics data, uh, where we use a spatial or spatially aware method, we sort of like take the spatial encodings into consideration when we do this dimension at the reduction step and then cluster our data. And that allows us to identify something slightly different to these phenotypes being sort of like these spatial niches. So instead of saying you're a T cell or a B cell, we can say whether a cell belongs to a light zone or a dark zone. And so it's, it's kind of like this idea of spatial niches and spatially aware methods that I kind of like now wanted to address, I guess. And to give an example here, we apply this to our TLS cosmics data. And again, we did some QCs, some normalization. And then we had this spatially aware dimensional the reduction step. 
uh, where after we sort of like cluster these sort of like spatially informed embeddings. And we get sort of like these uh, coherent spatial representations or clusters of our data. And there's quite a lot of different images here. So I'm just gonna zoom in on three of them. So what you're seeing here, each dot corresponds to a cell and the color of that cell corresponds to the identity uh, or the niche that that cells belong to. And what's pretty nice here is that we see these contiguous coherent spatial clusters, but they're also sort of like consistent across different uh, field of views and also between different patients. And it's pretty nice because what you're seeing here is actually a segmentation-like behavior, which allows us to identify these sort of like TLS sites in an unsupervised way. Of course, we can sort of like rely on a pathologist annotating our adjacent HNA images, and that's also something we're doing. But this is kind of like nice to have this sort of like convergent evidence using different orthogonal methods. And so with these sort of like uh, niche information and this phenotype information that we can get using single cell methods, we actually have two different layers of information now that we now can combine, which allows us to answer and address certain questions, such as, for example, whether there are niche-specific interactions, such as whether our cell type tend to interact more or less with another cell type in a certain niche. And we can also make these conditional analyses, uh, such as whether our cell type behaves differently depending on location. Usually when we do sort of like uh, an analysis, we say that the expression is conditioned on the phenotype, but now we can also say what, and examine whether the expression is conditioned on the phenotype and the niche, or maybe only the niche. And uh, with that, I'm going to hand it back to Lisa, who's going to wrap this up. Thanks, Alma. So from these types of information, we're able to ask questions then on what genes are really important during maturation and in these different TLS states during diffuse um, immature and mature TLSs. And we hope that by resolving these spatial features of tumor-associated TLSs, we can further understand their role in the tumor microenvironment and hopefully spur novel therapeutic strategies to induce a mature TLS. And with that, I'd like to thank an entire team that helped to do this, and I will pass it back to Arit and Helgar. Thank you, Alma. Thank you, Lisa. Now it's time my time to introduce the next speaker. The second speaker is Sandra Vikovic, Dr. Sandra Vikovic from, um, from, from different sites. So for insiders, Sandra's famous for running two labs, actually on two different continents, being the director of, the, of technology and innovation and co-faculty at the New York Genome Center and Columbia University, but also Wallenberg um, Academy Fellow at Uppsala University in Sweden. So Sandra pioneered spatially resolved transcriptomics and genomics methods uh, that enable massive parallel and in situ profiling of intact tissue samples. And she has vast experience in spatial and single cell genomic methods, uh, data analysis, software implementation, and with a focus on developing um, accessible genomics tool for clinical use. So welcome, Sandra. Very much looking forward to, to listen to your talk. Over to you, wherever you are. <laughs> Thanks, Hogar. Um, let me share my screen. Um, so today I was thinking to present a new project that has been ongoing in the lab for a while that we termed um, spatial host microbiome sequencing. Uh, but I always like to present uh, for, you know, the, the vast audience, um, the intro into spatial technologies and how, how we are thinking about the tech depth space there. Um, so the idea became, uh, behind spatial transcriptomics was basically that if we would take uh, existing workloads in pathology, and currently we're, you're looking at the tissue microarray, that's a five times 10 matrix, each circle represents patient tissue. Um, in this case, we're looking at 50 corrective cancer patients, and a pathologist can, after years of training, um, you know, process and look at these images and based on the stainings of and the shades of the purple and the pink and the size and shape of cells, uh, make call on diagnosis. Um, and sometimes, of course, the pathologist has um, staining and information from known markers. Uh, but however, um, it's very hard to make the you NOVA know, discoveries using these type of technologies. Uh, the benefit of it is already in a clinical workflow. So we definitely wanted to uh, source um, that type of information and experience, but incorporated with high resolution molecular information um, to kind of enable um, de novo discoveries. Um, in order to do that, we developed spatial transcriptomics or ST for short. And the initial idea that we published in 2016 was basically um, based on producing a spatial barcoded microarray, which you see on your left hand side. Um, it was a 1000 barcoded uh, matrix. Um, each of these spots represents a different barcode. Um, the barcode actually encodes an X and Y cartesian coordinate on a glass slide. 
Um, so if you would use inject printing and by 1000 oligos from IDT, you could deposit these known oligo sequences onto a glass slide. Uh, for example, then in the upper left corner, um, there's an ACTG sequence decoding spatial barcode uh, coordinate 1, 1. And just next to it, there's a different um, sequence, potentially, you know, ATCC, and it encodes a Cartesian coordinate 1, 2. Um, if we zoom in on the right hand side, we would see that um, there's a spatial barcode um, and there's multiple copies of the spatial barcode uh, and the probes um, in each spot, around 1 million copies and 100 micron diameter spot. Uh, it's preceded by Lumina adapter, but it's followed by UMI and poly DT sequence. And for us that have worked with Lumina based technologies, definitely recognize this immediately as an RNA seq library. Um, after um, the spatial barcode and microarrays were produced, um, you would put tissue on them, you would do H and &E staining, you would do imaging. Uh, when you're doing imaging, you're recapitulating all the workflows and pathology you have today, and you're collecting the H and &E information for the pathologist. Um, but you're also recording uh, where your tissue is respective to the spatial barcode and microarray. The next steps are a series of enzymatic reactions in which the cells are permeabilized, the mRNA flows on top of the spatial barcode and microarray, it attaches to the oligoprobes. Uh, we do reverse transcription in situ, and at that point we copy the mRNA information from the tissues directly on your barcoded glass slides. After that, we do paired end sequencing. Uh, which means that before sequencing, you only have the H and E information, but after sequencing, you have information um, on thousands of genes uh, in each of these tissue voxels at 100 micron resolution. Um, over the years, we spend a lot of time um, trying to make this technology multimodal, but also trying to increase the resolution of this technology. Um, so over the years, we went from 100 micron spot, 55 micron spot, all of you know in Visium, to HDSD and 2 micron resolution that will hopefully soon be released as the HD Visium product. Um, again, as we will focus a lot on applying these um, technologies into the clinical workflows, uh, we also often get the question of, well, how many cells and tissues and fields of view do we need to sample? So recently in collaboration with Dennis Shapiro and Aviv, uh, we released a paper on spatial power analysis where we try to answer, well, what is the sample size? Uh, what is the cellular composition? Uh, field of view size, number of fields of view and spatial distribution in your tissues to help you better design your spatial experiments. Um, if we are now looking at um, a mouse spleen section on the left-hand side, um, you see the section that's color coded by cell type. In the middle, you actually see our reconstruction in silico tissues, um, again, color coded by uh, cell types. So we designed this workflow to, for you to, after your pilot experiment, be able to better know how to sample your tissues. The simplest question you can then ask is, well, if my resolution is at the certain size of the field of view, for example, 0.5% of a tissue size, you're imaging with a 1020x objective. What is the probability of discovering a, a rare cell type? If you consider a rare cell type something that's present in 3% frequency in your tissue. So in this case, you would at least need to um, sample four fields of view to reach 80% saturation of the tissue or 80% chance of discovering of a single um, rare cell in your tissue. Um, given that we have also spent a lot of time designing these tools and know a little bit better now how many um, tissues and animals or human subjects we need to sample, we proceeded to ask the following question is, how can we model extrinsic effects in tissues? What do we mean by that? Um, so inspired by the Sonnenberg um, review from 2017, where they hypothesized that different bacterial genera and different bacterial families are lined um, differently along the proximal to distal axis in the gut, um, that they actually, um, the composition of these bacterial cultures and bacterial families um, influence how the host behaves in different, or host cells behave in different parts of the gut. Uh, we went on and developed a technology that we termed a spatial host microbiome sequencing. Um, again, given our all the work in the spatial power analysis, now we could actually um, know how much we needed to sample. We took three mouse models uh, to, to try to model the effects of bacteria on host cells. We took normal laboratory SPF mice, we took the germ-free mice as controls, and we did ASF mouse, so mice with defined uh, flora that you inoculate in the mouse. 
as their positive controls. Um, and through a series of reactions on the array surface, we came up with a way to repurpose your Bezium arrays to do targeted capture. Um, how does it actually look? It, it means that um, in our case, we took um, 16S uh, capture probe to capture the V4 variable regions of the bacterial genomes. We attach this probe in certain concentrations um, to the array surface. We do an extension reaction on the array surface. We strip one of the probes. And now what happens is that each and every single spatially barcoded spot on your arrays has a mixture of polydity capture and 16S capture probes. In our case, um, that ratio was approximately 50-50. Um, because we were developing a new technology, we also had to develop new computational tools. Uh, we decided to build the workflows on top of Kraken and build a new DL model that basically um, in a much um, easier and a much um, more accurate way distinguishes uh, spatially host microbiome reads um, at the genus level with 97% accuracy, which basically means that 90% approximate of all the reads you put in um, the pipeline, you will get out uh, with a bacterial ID at the genus level. Um, as with any technology development, we have to go through um, two tasks in validations. Uh, usually, uh, we validate spatial data into the bulk. Um, in this case, we were on the x-axis validating spatial host microbiome sequencing versus 16S sequencing. Um, we get great correlation, so it means that what you would get with your 16S typing, um, you can get with spatial host microbiome data. Um, Again, because this is a spatial array, uh, we needed to validate it against another spatial method. In this case, we're validating against fish. Um, so you're looking at the ASF mouse, which I mentioned was our positive control. So we can actually design good fish probes against certain ASF species. And we can look, look at the spatial correlations between, again, on the x-axis, spatial host microbiome sequencing and the y-axis, the fish experiments. Um, so we see that we detect the exact bacterial species in the correct um, tissue and lumen um, areas. Uh, but we, you know, designed all these methods to uh, be able to read out bacteria by sequencing. So what you're seeing is on the left-hand side is the canonical um, illustration of the crypt architecture in the column. On the right-hand side, you, it's color-coded by actual um, bacterial levels detected by sequencing, where we see that the most bacteria are detected in the pellet of the lumen. Um, and then the second most abundant is this layer that's coating the um, tissue called the apex and mucus layer. Um, if we would focus a little bit on the apex and mucus layer, which is the protective layer that um, the goblet cells kind of secrete into the gut, so we wouldn't get infected by pathogenic bacteria, um, we would see that we can easily identify highly abundant species and highly abundant genera. In this case, it's so the Buterbibris or the Lephalosaurinococcus. For clarity, we can definitely detect both gram positive and negative bacteria. Uh, but we also designed this to be able to read out well what happens um, in the apex and mucus layer in the presence of bacteria to the actual host. So that we, if we're comparing now the SPF mouse, which is which I mentioned with the typical laboratory mouse to the germ-free mouse, which doesn't have and is depleted of any bacteria. Uh, we see that you know, germ-free mice need, for example, more set V2 expression um, to actually um, maintain the tissue homeostasis because they don't have the protective mucus layer. Whereas um, in, in normal SPF mice, when bacteria are present, uh, goblet cells secrete a ton of mucin 2 to form that uh, protective layer. Um, of course, we didn't design this tech to look at only two genes. Uh, we decided, you know, the spatial micro microbiome sequencing does the transcriptome in an unbiased level. Um, so we wanted to ask, well, what happens in this um, apex layer in the presence of bacteria, for example, in the presence of specific pseudobacteria genera, uh, which cell types are actually present in the apex and what genes are expressed in the presence of bacteria in these specific cell types versus the germ-free control. Um, so coming to my last slide, and I think this is, you know, I saw it a bit packed slide, so bear with me. Um, on the upper part of the heat map, um, you're looking at the SPF mouse. So what happens in presence of bacteria, the lower part of the heat map is the germ-free mouse. So 
no presence of bacteria. Um, and um, each column is a different um, activated pathway. Um, each row is a different cell type uh, that exhibits a certain pathway, activity in a pathway in presence of certain bacteria. And what we can conclude is that, you know, uh, for example, um, tough cells in presence of coprococcus do one thing and one type of um, pathways activated versus, you know, in another layer, tough cells in presence of sodolipose do a completely different thing. Um, so this is the first showcase where we can actually uh, prove that there are intrinsic effects that um, can be modeled in uh, spatial data. Um, just a sneak peek of what we're working on now, uh, you know, we went through these iterations of ST to HDST. Um, now we are working on developing something we'll call micro ST at 10 micron resolution um, in a very cheap manner, and also further improving HDST in different multimodal um, settings. Uh, so with, with this, I'll wrap up um, and say thank you to the many funders, mentors, trainees. Uh, also, thank you for um, HCA and the committee for inviting me to speak here today. And I'm happy to take a few questions in the chat. Thanks, Sonia. I was on mute. Could you hear me? No. We can hear you now. Perfect. So um, Sanja has to leave in a bit. So feel free to ask questions in the chat now. So she will be able to answer next minutes. In the meantime, I introduce our third speaker, Dr. Rong Fan from Yale University. Uh, Rong's research is focused on the development of single cell and spatial multi-omics profiling technologies, very often based on microfabricated devices to investigate pathogenesis and therapeutic response of complex human diseases, including cancer, autoimmunity, and cardiovascular diseases. Uh, Rong is famous in the HCA community for his spatial NGS-based approach called DBITSIG, for spatial transcriptome mapping, spatial hyplex protein mapping, and spatial epigenome mapping. So welcome, Rong. I'm happy to learn more about latest DBITSIG applications and beyond. I hope. Yeah. Your stage. Um yeah, uh, thank you so much, uh, Hager, and uh, thanks uh, the committee for having me here. I'm going to go ahead and share my slides. All right, you can see my slides well? Yeah, it looks good. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so, okay, this is my disclaimer. And uh, yeah, I think Asanya did a, a terrific job to kind of describe the technology roadmap, uh, in particular, in sort of high throughput NGS based uh, sequencing for uh, spatial transcriptome sequence uh, spatial transcriptome profiling and so uh, so here I just put a one slide to uh, kind of expand a little bit the entire space uh, over in the past 10 years uh, when people realize the spatial context is so important and in particular our microscopy colleagues uh, really pushing the boundary uh, by developing a number of uh, spatial, uh, so imaging based uh, spatial mix technology to map a uh, large number of uh, proteins and also uh, almost entire transcriptome. Uh, but I think uh, as Sanya and, uh, and my laboratory uh, have been very interesting over the past years is can we use uh, like an Illumina sequencer to, to do spatial uh, kind of gene expression profiling or other type of omics in a completely unbiased manner? Uh, and, and across the entire genome scale, and such so that you really have the power to do uh, kind of kind of fundamental biological discovery. And so the approach we uh, we, we took, uh, I think a number of years ago, we uh, published in cell uh, called the basic, uh, which is kind of totally opposite mm. from what everyone else is doing in this space. Uh, they all follow uh, more or less the same fundamental principle. I think I'm saying, yeah, and the Professor Joaquin Lambert Cohen called buckler solid surface uh, for messenger eye capture and the transcriptome sequencing. So in our case, we uh, basically send the DNA barcodes uh, into the tissue and the tissue itself is in the reaction chamber. And uh, uh, if we can barcode messenger eye, we, we do spatial transcriptome, but we can also barcode other 
uh, biomolecules in the tissue as well. And so after we published the, this paper, it turns out I think many groups were able to adopt this technology. I think this is one of the papers published uh, already published in Nature Communication a couple of months ago uh, from a group in Munich. Uh, they were able to kind of redesign the device uh, making it much higher throughput. So once one experiment, you can, you can map down uh, nine tissue sections. And I think a few other groups kind of kind of use the same deterministic uh, microfluidic uh, patterning approach to create uh, the barcode surface. Uh, so you, you still can kind of do barcode surface machine generic capture, but you can make your own vision array. So if you can make your own vision array, a very, very um, kind of low cost uh, 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 manner and also whatever resolution you like. Uh, it doesn't need to be 55 micron, it could be much smaller uh, down to like a five micron, I believe that's totally durable. Uh, so how the technology works, I'm gonna just uh, skip that, uh, but just to tell you we, uh, we use the two different microfluid devices to send the DNA barcodes. Uh, into the tissue and uh, ligate them together. Uh, if those barcodes are probing uh, the polyatel of the messenger, you get a whole transcriptome, uh, but you can use, also use the seismic uh, trick to, to turn the detection of the proteins into uh, the, the, the NGS radar. Uh, so if the, the same chemistry will follow, but you get a the detection of the, uh, a panel of proteins. Uh, so I think this is the first time we um, we report sort of the multi-omic sequencing uh, in a spatial resolved manner and uh, uh, in this uh, same issue uh, of nature methods. Um, I think everyone got so excited because that was uh, when the spatial transcriptome was selected as method of year. And our work was highlighted uh, saying the multi-omic sequencing goes spatial. Uh, but in that cell paper, we demonstrate like 22 proteins. Uh, and the question is, uh, so if you're trying to say truly multi-omic and a large number of uh, proteins uh, and the transcriptome, and 22 is definitely not large enough, but can we go to like a hundreds or even thousands? Uh, so I don't have the answer, but I, I told my students, can we just give it a try? And so this is the data we collected from about like 200 uh, proteins from uh, different, uh, a variety of different mouse tissues. And so I think this paper and uh, uh, we just published in Nature Biotech a week ago and uh, also Dan Landau's lab uh, at uh, Wild Cornell and, and the collaborators uh, at the Tenex Genomics, they published very, very similar approach uh, in, uh, in the same issue, Nature, Bio Nature Biotech. Uh, so for human proteins, um, we were able to have an uh, even larger panel, about 300 proteins uh, profile in conjunction with the entire transcriptome. Uh, what, what you see here is the unsupervised clustering of all 300 proteins. Um, you, you see very nice clusters, about seven different clusters, but now you can see where they are. So this is sort of the B cell follicle. You can even see light zone, dark zone. Uh, this is T cell zone. And proteins, uh, transcriptome gives you uh, more or less the same sort of spatial patterns, but uh, the proteins appear to be uh, kind of e e even e even better to, to define the spatially distinct features. Uh, however, I don't want to really claim that. Uh, uh, I just want to point out, uh, even though we are able to profile 300 proteins, which sounds very impressive, um, and, and we actually use only 10% of the sequencing length for uh, profiling 300 proteins, uh, but the sequencing depth per protein is about like a one order magnitude higher than the sequence depth per gene or when you're doing a spatial transcriptome. So that might explain to some degree why you get a very, very distinct uh, spatial features based on the proteins. Uh, so you can look at individual proteins, for example, CD19, B cell marker, surface marker, but also some functional proteins in this case, IgM producing B cells localized in the germinal center and IgG producing more mature B cells or they migrate out of the germinal center. And the naive B cells producing IgD just exit the microvasculature. Um, you can look at, look at the T cell zone by looking at the T cell markers as well. Um, so when, uh, when we kind of develop any kind of new assays, you always need to kind of validate uh, 
so here we use uh, kind of adjacent tissue sections to validate uh, the spatial pattern of different proteins. Uh, you can see very strong concordance in terms of the spatial distribution. I think another strong validation experiment is we uh, sort of integrate the data uh, from the single cell size and the spatial size and perform this uh, uh, clustering and you get a UMAP. Uh, so now you can see, okay, the, the same UMAP, okay, from the same protein uh, from the single cell data versus the spatial uh, data points, whether or not they co localize in the same region of the UMAP, you, you see very, very strong concordance. For example, uh, I think the CD20 very small subset, but they're stronger local localized in the, in the same region from two different data sets. And the same thing for many other uh, protein markers as well. Um, so since we can look at the proteins uh, uh, in the tissue, so that means uh, you are no longer limited to uh, the proteins in the cells, uh, on the sur cell surface or inside the cell, you can look at it, some extra cellular components. Uh, so the sample we look at in this case is human uh, heart valve, either mitral valve or aortic valve. And so this is data from uh, 10 different valvular tissues uh, and and I, I think uh, uh, the top five, uh, the upper five panels are showing uh, the, the valves from diseased uh, 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 tissue specimens. Those are from healthy control. And so now you can uh, see different layers and different spatial uh, structures uh, from transcriptome, but also from 300 proteins. Uh, so although the proteins seem to give you a little bit more distinct spatial pattern, but you do see very strong uh, concordance between the, the transcriptome and the, prote and the proteome defined uh, spatial patterns. Uh, but what is unique here is we have 300 uh, proteins uh, plus a panel of extra serial matrix proteins, a uh, co-profile at the same time uh, in conjunction with the entire transcriptome. So I just show you 10 of those uh, extra serial matrix proteins. Uh, so they, they sort of co-localize in a similar region, which is not a surprise, but you still see some kind of differential uh, expression pattern of those extracellular matrix proteins in, in the valves. Uh, so what about uh, other um, omics uh, kind of beyond the uh, transcript on the proteins? Uh, so we decided to look at the epigenetic mechanisms that can regulate the gene expression. Uh, first of all, there's global uh, chromatin accessibility. And so the elegant chemistry developed by, well, Greeny from Howard Chan at Stanford uh, called ataxic, uh, used TM5 transposes pre-assembled with DNA oligo uh, to process in the tissue. Thus you're gonna insert the DNA oligos into uh, the open chromatin region of, uh, of the genome DNA. Uh, but in our case, we kind of further incorporate the spatial barcodes A and the barcodes B. So now, so of every single pixel, you have entire ataxic data trace uh, and a whole genome scale. Uh, so now we uh, uh, took that uh, technology to look at a uh, human tonsil again, uh, look at the germinal center. So, um, so now in this case, you can look at not just the, uh, the, the canonic surface markers, um, and, but you can really look at uh, for example, master transferring factors, uh, P P uh, PAX5 uh, for germinal center B cells and B cell 6 uh, for germinal center uh, GC B cells, but also follicular helper T cells. Uh, so what is interesting here is the uh, uh, FOXP3, <laughs> which is known to be um, the tra transferring factor uh, for uh, uh, from the regulatory T cells. We, we saw a lot of those kind of epigenetically red uh, Fox, uh, Fox B3 positive cells, uh, but we did an immune standing and uh, we did a uh, fish on the, the same tissue as really not of uh, not that many Fox B3 cells. Uh, I think the, the, the interpretation is uh, actually is super interesting. Uh, I think in the actual follicular zone, there are a lot of Fox B3 epigenetic prime or epigenetic red cells there. And if, if they seen the tissue in a, a hyperinflammatory uh, re reaction or condition, they are ready to go to rescue. So, but they don't have to behave like regulatory T cell at the moment. But they are ready to go to do that job if they say that's necessary. Um, so we we further kind of um, uh, uh, so look at the specific modification rather than global. 
And so in this case, we're looking at three different histone marks, uh, K27 trimethyl, K4 trimethyl, and the K27 acetylation uh, across um, the, the several tissue sections uh, of the embryonic uh, mouse uh, brain. Uh, so in this case, uh, even without doing multiplex uh, uh, cut and tag or multiplex histone modification uh, mapping, you cannot know sort of how the different histone marks uh, differentially control the tissue uh, type or tissue uh, maintenance, uh, and, and uh, maybe collectively they can uh, sort, of, sort of control the different tissue regions. For example, right here, this histone mark uh, uh, can resolve a lot of different tissue uh, uh, types or cell types, uh, but this histone, histone mark does not. So you can see sort of this differential uh, regulation of uh, different histone modifications, even without doing this multiplex cut and tag. Uh, so recently, we were able to kind of further combine epigenomic transcriptome um, by demonstrating uh, both uh, a tag and a whole transcriptome and a cut and tag and a whole transcriptome. Uh, it sounds very straightforward since we have both and uh, we just combine reagents, uh, but there are very different assays. It, it, it does require a lot of optimization to get a uh, both assays compatible on the same tissue. So just show you one example here, uh, this embry embryonic mouse brain. Uh, so we, we did a co-profiling uh, by showing your data from uh, the, the ATAC and epigenome and uh, from the transcriptome. Uh, so either one can give you a relatively precise uh, clustering and a spatial uh, tissue identification. Uh, uh, however, when you have both, you can really look at a difference. That's number one. You can also look at the dynamics. So in this case, we look at the uh, micro, uh, the radio glia uh, differentiation to uh, neuronal lineage. And the first step is post mitotic print mature neurons, and so you can see the radio glia uh, cells are localized in a ventricle. Uh, and once they become more committed to neuronal lineage, they migrate in, into brain. Um, uh, so you can look at this pseudo time differentiation process by looking at all the genes. And not a big surprise, most of the genes are sort of the chromatin open first and then gene expressed. Uh, but we saw a group of genes that they are, they are uh, totally opposite. So uh, when you have the chromatin open in the beginning, yes, you see gene expression. But the chromatin remains open, uh, but those genes uh, uh, started to diminish very quickly. And we found what are those genes? Uh, those are kind of oligodendrocyte uh, or oligodendrocyte progenitor cell genes. Uh, so that means, uh, so even though those cells are already committed to neuronal lineage, they still maintain the epigenetic potential uh, for oligodendrocyte lineage. So if they see some external cue, they might transdifferentiate into uh, 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 oligodendrocyte lineages. Uh, so we have the data from the cut and tag and the whole transcriptome. There's kind of three uh, uh, different assays, but uh, three different tissue sections. But each of those, we have the whole transcriptome uh, spatial map as well. So in this case, it's kind of like a technical replicate. Uh, when you just uh, look at their spatial distribution of different clusters, you, you, you begin to appreciate how, how consistent the, the assay is. Technical consistency is very high. Uh, across the three different uh, uh, replicates. Uh, so I'm probably gonna um, kind of skip the biology story here, but uh, jump to what I believe in the future would look like. Uh, so although we are very proud of our own uh, kind of deeper based spatial omics, spatial multi-omics, spatial epigenomics, uh, but I believe uh, if we can combine the imaging and the spatial uh, omics sequencing that's going to uh, significantly enrich uh, and, uh, and further empower your discovery, enrich your data and empower discovery. Just show you one example of what we are trying to work on. And so uh, we, we, we try to uh, kind of on the same tissue combine our uh, spatial omics sequencing with uh, the SRS imaging or mass back uh, imaging to link uh, so pixel by pixel uh, every single cell on, on the slide, we, we know their metabolic function. We know the metabolic activity. Uh, so I, I think that the same thing can be applied to other imaging modality uh, and can, in conjunction with the spatial transcriptome on the same tissue. I, I believe that's gonna be much more powerful uh, data 
uh, for uh, uh, for discovery, uh, for biological discovery. Uh, so I'm gonna uh, just uh, uh, conclude here. We develop those technologies. I, I really see in the future is to 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 really combine uh, different modalities uh, on the same tissue to to get a, the best out of uh, not just the both. Actually, you have much more powerful data set. And our, our own interest, I think, in two different areas, I think one is brain research, and the other is kind of immunology and the seriousness and the aging. Uh, so thank you, everyone. And um, I'm happy to take the questions uh, in the chat box and also uh, in, a, in, a, in a panel discussion afterwards. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rong, for a great talk. And now we're going to uh, move to our last speaker for this webinar, and it is William or Will Huang. Will is a principal investigator and a physician scientist at the Center for Systems Biology, Center for Cancer Research, and Department of Radiation Oncology at MGH, where he leads uh, the Laboratory for Spatial and Systems Oncology and cares for patients with GI malignancies. Will's lab focuses on tumor stroma interactions at high resolution through the development and application of techniques in single cell and spatial biology, advanced microscopy, and functional screens to patient-derived specimens, organoids, and genetically engineered mouse models. And Will is going to tell us today about intracellular mechanisms of therapeutic resistance in pancreatic cancers that he identifies by single cell spatial transcriptomics. Will, take it away. Thank, thank you so much for the kind introduction, Ravit, and uh, really happy to be here. Um, appreciate the organizers inviting me to uh, give a talk during this webinar. Um, so um, as Ravit mentioned, um, we uh, have been applying various uh, spatial technologies to try to understand uh, potential resistance mechanisms um, in pancreatic cancer and other GI cancers. So I'm going to kind of walk through uh, a story um, that we've been working on ever since I was a, a postdoc um, in Aviv Regev's lab working with Arit and others, um, <clears throat> and then um, kind of show you how we've applied the various technologies you already heard about from uh, the great earlier talks during the session. So pancreatic cancer, just by way of background, you know, is one of the worst solid tumors, uh, pretty recalcitrant to cytotoxic therapy, immunotherapy, most of the things that we've been, uh, we've come up with to, to throw at this disease. Um, so one of the interests in this cancer is, uh, even though most patients do poorly, still try to understand where we can stratify patients at a molecular level and start to, to move pancreatic cancer therapies um, into uh, the precision oncology realm. So over the past decade or so, uh, several seminal studies looking at um, gene expression states in bulk of pancreatic tumors have converged on these two binary states, uh, broadly known as basal-like or quasi-mesenchymal versus classical. And these bulk-derived states are, uh, are prognostic uh, and have some predictive power. So you can see on the bottom here, um, these are metastatic pancreatic cancer patients. You can see that the purple line representing um, patients with tumors that are, um, that are at, at the bulk level, primarily classical versus basal, they do better. Um, uh, and they also seem to respond more to treatment if you look at the waterfall plot to multi-agent chemotherapy. But there are some limitations to these prior bulk derived cell states. First of all, they were primarily derived in the untreated uh, setting. Uh, most of them were primary tumors. And uh, as research has moved forward on the clinical front, um, there's evidence that many patients derive benefit from upfront or neoadjuvant therapy. That could be chemotherapy, that could be radiotherapy, um, as well as uh, other forms of neoadjuvant therapy laid out nicely in this table from a review recently published in Nature Review's Clinical Oncology. So there is a there is an important need to really understand what the diversity of cell states in pancreatic cancer is uh, in the post-treated setting. These are also the patients that tend to be enrolled on our clinical trials. They, they've already seen chemotherapy uh, for the most part, at the very least. So several years ago, um, in collaboration with uh, some of the people you see pictured here on the right, uh, in, in Aviv's lab at the Broad, we undertook this uh, single nucleus RNA sequencing study 
um, using frozen pancreatic tumors that were biobanked at Mass General. Um, and among other things, we really sought to try to refine the molecular taxonomy of pancreatic cancer. And when we looked at the malignant cell population in our cohort, um, and we did a de novo uh, consensus NMF analysis, we were able to recapitulate some of the bulk subtypes like classical, um, the basal-like or quasi-mesenchymal, we were able to resolve into separate basaloid, squamoid, and mesenchymal um, subtypes. And then most interesting to us at the time was this uh, finding of this neuro-like progenitor uh, cell state, <clears throat> which features uh, expression of genes normally associated with neurodevelopment, stem-like state, and we wanted to investigate this a little further. So in our cohort of 43 patients, we looked uh, at the normalized program expression across these seven malignant programs we had identified as a function of treatment status. So we have untreated versus CRT as chemotherapy, radiotherapy, and then the extra L in CRTL as low sartan. And you can see as expected that the more treatment you give, the less representation you have of the classical program in the residual cancer cells. You see the opposite trend uh, with the, the neuro-like or NERP uh, program. Um, and then mesenchymal, we saw kind of a, 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 a trend towards uh, enrichment in post-treatment residual disease that did not reach significance. So this data was not matched pre and post-treatment. So we also derived some organoids uh, from our patient cohort, um, untreated patients, and we treated with ex vivo chemo radiation, and we saw an enrichment in uh, neurolite progenitor score as well in that setting. And then when we looked at independent bulk RNA sequencing cohorts from TCGA and ICGC, we found in our multivariable Cox regression analysis for various clinical variables that, as expected, the clinical uh, sorry, the classical um, uh, cell state was associated with the best prognosis, and then interestingly, the NERP program was associated with the worst prognosis. So we wanted to put these findings into the in situ context and try to understand, you know, uh, whether these malignant cell states were associated with specific features in the local micro niche and what that might mean and start to look at intercellular um, dynamics uh, between malignant cell states that we had identified in this dissociated data set and, and the in situ context. So uh, we uh, did an early access partnership with Nanostring. Uh, you had already, you've already heard about the genomics platform, so I won't really talk too much about the technique here. But we did serial sectioning of uh, a subset of our tumors, 21 to be exact. Uh, we performed various assays, um, but uh, I'm going to focus on the whole transcriptome um, panel here. And for each of the ROIs that we selected, uh, we separately segmented the epithelial cells the fibroblasts and the immune cells and interrogated these um, at the whole transcriptome level. And this is not single cell resolution data, right? So this is uh, pseudo bulk spatial data. Um, so what we did was we took the uh, epithelial segments and the fibroblast segments, we scored those for our consensus NMF derived programs um, generated in our SNOOC-seq data set. And for the immune segments, uh, we deconvolve them using our immune cell type signatures, again, derived from the, the SNOOC-seq data set. And when we did this, the most robust uh, unsupervised clustering that we got led to three uh, neighborhoods. Um, and uh, these included what we call the treatment-enriched neighborhood that featured uh, this neuro-like progenitor uh, malignant state, the mesenchymal malignant state, uh, as well as um, uh, 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 inflammatory uh, fibroblasts. Um, denoted here by IMM, and the CDA T cells, which, which was a curious association for us. And then the two other neighborhoods that we identified uh, were we called squamoid basaloid and classical based on the predominant uh, malignant subtype. So this, among other findings uh, that we found from the geomics platform, were really interesting and hypothesis generating. But even at a kind of spatial omics level, we recognize that, you know, this depended on deconvolution of the immune segment, this dependent on scoring of, you know, 20 to hundreds of, um, of cancer cells or fibroblasts in a particular segment. So we wanted to improve our spatial resolution. Uh, we were willing to take a bit of a hit on the molecular plex since we had kind of matched data, whole transcriptome data, both from SNOOC-seq as well as digital spatial profiling. So for that, we again did an early access partnership with Nanostring on what's now COSMICS, um, the spatial molecular imaging technology. You can see, again, this is a subset of uh, tumors that we have SNOOC-seq data for, as well as genomics data for. 
Um, and so here you can see how we used our H and E sections, uh, consecutive sections to guide FOV placement. Um, I think uh, you know this audience is probably quite familiar at this point with how SMI works. So I'll just put the diagram up and, and not go through any more detail. Um, we were uh, pleasantly surprised by the, the early data and, and how it looked. So here's an example FOV. Um, you see immunofluorescence, uh, the immunofluorescence image on the left here, pancytic keratins in green. We've got some immune markers in red and yellow. And then on the right here, uh, we've kind of uh, made the protein stain more uh, transparent, and we've overlaid uh, as individual dots the RNA transcripts that have been pseudocolored based on expected cell type enrichment. Um, and you can see kind of zoomed in here, this region of uh, the segmentation and, and uh, a decent specificity for cancer cells versus stromal cells. So we did a small pilot study with 13 independent tumors, 15 samples overall. We used a standard 960 or, or base, I should say, 960 plex panel from Nanostring. We also uh, developed 30 custom spike ins specific for malignant and fibroblast subtyping based on our prior work. Um, and then for two of the samples, we did both panels uh, so that we could do uh, uh, some concordance uh, analyses. And then from this data set, uh, we did various neighborhood analyses. I'll give you a sampling of what we've been doing, as well as uh, some ligand receptor interaction analyses. So this is a UMAP and gene expression space um, of our malignant and non-malignant cells, which showed pretty good separation. And then these dot plots here show marker genes for various uh, immune and stromal and malignant uh, epithelial cell types that we were interested in. And then on the bottom here, um, with a 990 plex panel rather than a whole transcriptome, we weren't able to confidently um, annotate all seven malignant programs that we found in our SNCC data set. But we were able to, as you can see, pretty cleanly separate classical, basal, um, and neural-like progenitor. And then similarly, MICAPs and ICAPs. So one of the things we were interested in was kind of, you know, diving deeper into the neighborhood analysis that we, we scratched the surface of with genomics. So here we did kind of a pairwise proximity analysis using a Gaussian kernel model. And you can see all the different pairwise um, uh, cell type combinations, but I'm going to just zoom in on a couple. So I mentioned to you that CD8 T cell association with uh, the neural-like cancer cells that we found kind of curious. Um, I won't have time to show it today, but we're digging deeper into this idea that distinct malignant um, uh, subtypes may also employ different mechanisms of immune evasion. So there's an ongoing project there where we're looking at the immune population in much more detail. But just to see if this finding from genomics really um, holds up uh, at single cell resolution, uh, what we did uh, was we basically represented the, the spatial locations of CD8 T cells with uh, these summed Gaussian decay functions that generates this underlying topology you see here. We then um, annotated all the malignant cells in the FOV as being predominantly classical, basaloid, or uh, basal-like, or neuro-like. And predominant means that uh, more than 70% uh, of the, the overall score uh, fits that particular program. And then when we compared this to a null distribution where we scrambled the um, annotations, but not the positions of the malignant cells, um, and did a log full change of the observed distribution over the uh, expected null distribution, we found that sure enough, the neural-like cancer cells were found to be significantly more proximal to CD8 T cells than you would expect uh, from the null distribution, and the classical cancer cells were significantly depleted around CD8 T cells. So that corroborated the, the genomics finding. There was another finding, not from our group, but from Dave Tubison's group, uh, who had found many years ago that these inflammatory calves that express a lot of IL-6 tend to be further away from malignant cells than um, the myofibroblastic or mycats that express high levels of smooth muscle actin. So we did a similar proximity analysis with our data, and we looked at um, whether ICAPs or mycats, uh, where they were located relative to malignant cells. And again, we saw a significant enrichment of mycats near malignant cells and a significant depletion of ICATs near malignant cells, uh, corroborating this prior finding. <clears throat> the other interest I mentioned to you um, uh, for this data was to look at uh, ligand receptor cell-cell interactions. So we found you know, a lot of examples in the literature, and we found that you know, we wanted to improve upon this slightly in the way that we accounted for spatial coordinates of potentially communicating cells, as well as their gene expression of the receptor ligand pair. 
So uh, in collaboration with the uh, Martin Hemberg Lab and his um, uh, amazing postdoc, Jing Yi, picture here, uh, we developed this approach called Spatially Constrained Optimal Transport Interaction Analysis, or SCOTIA. And um, in brief, uh, we basically um, first um, identified adjacent source and target cluster pairs uh, to, uh, to really, for the downstream analyses, and we uh, ignored, for the purposes of the analysis, uh, source cell clusters and target cell clusters that were far apart. Um, then we designed um, a cost function that accounted for both gene expression of the ligand and receptor, which is represented by the dot size, um, as well as um, uh, spatial distance, and developed, uh, based on optimal transport theory, these spatially constrained cell-cell interaction scores. And then we could look at various biological comparisons of interest. So one of our uh, most interest, you know, uh, of greatest interest, as I mentioned early on, was uh, what happens in the post-treatment setting. So when we compare these various uh, cell type uh, pairs that might be interacting in the treated versus untreated cohorts. We saw that calf uh, source cells and malignant target cells, that interaction was the most enriched, as you can see by this thickened cord in this cord diagram. So um, we chose to focus on this interaction first. And you can see in this volcano plot, the red dots represent uh, predicted interactions that are enriched in the post-treated setting, the purple, those that are depleted. Um, you see some interesting things. There's a lot of chemokine interactions. Cytokine interactions in particular, I'll point out, I won't have time to talk about the biology, but an area of great interest to us from uh, that was spurred by this finding was IL-6 family, uh, which we know are those ligands are produced um, in high concentrations by ICAPS. And you can see some family members, CLCF1, CNTFR, LIF, IL-6ST. So we're definitely exploring the biology of that. And on the um, converse, we see um, what seems to be a depletion in CAF uh, Wnt ligands um, uh, targeting uh, uh, Wnt receptors like frizzled on the malignant cells. And here is just visually, you can see the CLCF1 CNTFR interaction that was pulled out by our Scotia method. You can see four example FOVs. Um, again, the dot size represents the expression of the ligand or receptor. Um, and you can see how different it looks in the post treated setting uh, versus the untreated setting. We also, just in my last minute here, I'll just mention that. We have looked um, at orthogonal complementary data sets, so we do see a positive correlation that's significant between our SMI uh, Scotia predictions as well as the SNUC-seq uh, ligand receptor expression full change between treated and untreated. We also look um, at the downstream from the, the trust uh, and KEG um, databases, the downstream uh, predicted activated and repressed targets of the various receptors in the same malignant cells. And we do see a positive and negative correlation that are significant overall, um, as you would expect if these are real interactions. Um, and then, you know, we can dig into specific things like this WINT uh, signaling um, with the predicted decrease in this interaction between calves and malignant cells. We also see a con concomitant uh, lower calf expression of WINT ligands in the post treated setting and a significantly higher expression of Wnt ligands and malignant cells, suggesting potential Wnt niche independence is being um, developed in these post-treatment uh, malignant cells. And then I think I'm out of time here, so I'll stop here, but just mention that we're doing functional validation. You know, we've looked at co-cultures, uh, murine co-cultures. We're again seeing a positive correlation between enriched interactions and depleted interactions post-treatment, and we're doing additional kind of genetic engineering type follow-up to see which of these candidates really is mediating um, uh, therapeutic resistance and IL-6 family um, interactions uh, we're starting to see from fibroblasts may actually drive cancer cell plasticity um, in interesting ways. So um, I'll stop there um, and just uh, thank you guys for your time. I'd like to thank all of our patients and their families for their generosity and supporting our research. Um, all the members of my, uh, my lab and collaborators um, my postdoc mentors that, you know, I started my lab not that long ago, Tyler and Aviv pictured here, as well as all of our funding agencies. Thank you very much. Thank you so, so much, Will. Um, let's thank the speakers, all the speakers for their uh, wonderful talks. So thank you. Uh, and we'll now move to the panel discussion. Um, so please make sure if you have uh, specific questions for the panel discussion, just put them in the Q&A box. And uh, I'll start with one question that we already uh, sort of saw in the, in the questions. Um, as a newcomer to the field, how, do, how can I decide which technology to use? 
not for our panel. Maybe technology and also modality, no? Because we've seen yeah. see histone, histone modification profiling. Definitely. A, that's probably one for wrong. Yeah. So what would you profile and choose? Yeah, I constantly got this question. And also I felt um, in a in a spatial biology era, um, we we really need a, a different technologies to to kind of address the same question. Um is very unlikely. Okay, just one technology gonna dominate the entire field because every technology is producing very different data. Um, I think a hogger is mentioning if you're interested in epigenetics, yeah, you'll probably want to do kind of kind of those spatial epigenome analysis. Um, and also it depends on your question, you want to get a kind of unbiased discovery versus you just have a very specific panel you want to address clinically relevant questions. So um, yeah, so I, I, I think that technology landscape <laughs> slide I, I used over and over, I used to call that technology landscape, but now I call it technology family because I, I think everyone in this, in this, you know, big space, we're in the same family. We, yeah, we kind of work together to advance science. Yeah. And maybe just following up on this, so and looking at the different kind of modalities, do you see kind of advantages for certain modalities to go deeper into the characterization of cell states as compared to cell types? So that to that you would be able to extract more information, more features that would be able to characterize a cell or spatial coordinate in more depth. Yeah, I I I think that that um kind of it's related to what, what I alluded before. So do you need a kind of unbiased genome-wide data? Um, if so if the, the, the cell type or the cell state, you have no idea what that cell state is, but yeah, which is somewhat related to what we what we are working on, kind of serial senescence. And the senescent cells, people still can argue what, what are senescent cells, right? It's every time that's that's no question. So in that case, I, I would say the unbiased uh, global genome-wide discovery technology would be the first tool you should use. Um, but afterwards, maybe you can further kind of dive deeply into the specific markers to look at the, uh, how those cells impact the surrounding cells. Um, and, and also it would be great you have that, that, that kind of unbiased global characterization across different layers of the omics and epigenome transcriptome. And also recently I'm talking to Matthias Mann in uh, in Germany and was, oh, if we know those where, where those innocent cells are, can we cut out those cells, run your mass back and a high sensitivity mass back to get a protein-wide characterization? That's kind of what I'm thinking the path kind of leading towards the, the characterization, deep characterization of 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 complete new cell type, no one really know what that that cell type or state should look like. Do some of the other panelists want to to comment on this? Um, yeah, I think I think Ron was gave a great answer. Um, my only perspective would also be that um, lots of times as as a pathologist and as, as a clinician, I'm also often dictated by what do we have available. So when we're thinking about clinical samples or pa patient samples, we have to deal with what is the pre-analytic variability of those samples. And that can often determine what type of technology we want to use. We don't want to ask certain questions just because maybe we don't have the perfect specimen. We still want to be able to ask really good questions, even with less ideal specimens. And I think kind of this revolution in FFPE-based technologies has really helped us. Um, simultaneously, I would say that because we now have so many more options for how to how to use FFPE sort of samples in this single single cell wor world with all of these new technologies that allow us to profile FFPE blocks with disassociative set, set, uh, techniques, we're allowed to say, okay, let's do an unbiased approach with SnookSeq, come up with a panel or a targeted panel, and then ask more detailed questions with samples that possibly are not as high quality as we would want. And so we're really now able to do a lot of stuff we weren't able to do even six months to a year ago. Um, and so that oftentimes dictates how I, I approach a certain technology choices 
what do we have available to us right now? And let's let's keep trying to do science even if it's hard. So following up on your on what you said, Lisa, are there specific challenges that, that you face? Um, yeah, I think we also kind of got this question in the chat. Um, there's always going to be challenges in what type of tissues we get because um, oftentimes we don't have beautiful, perfectly preserved specimens with, you know, one centimeter by two centimeter areas to work with. Oftentimes we, you may get some of those, but oftentimes you actually are getting small scan core needle biopsies with significant edge effect, artifact, necrosis, et cetera. And so being able to use the technology that still allows us to profile those specimens while acknowledging that's going to be challenging. And I think this is where um, what Alma presented really comes in handy because um, this is not just single cell data. This is, this is, we don't want to throw away the spatial data. That's why we're doing it this way. And so combining these two approaches, I think, allows us to then profile these really challenging sorts of specimens. Yeah, and wrongly highlighted the kind of value of genome-wide profiling. And we've seen uh, um, in the presentations data from the SMI or Cosmics profiling, which is more targeted, so it's a larger panel. But how applying those targeted, uh, not genome-wide technologies, how do you see the trade-off and what are the kind of the barriers to integrate both? Um, Lisa, you mentioned a pre-designed panel coming from a, maybe seeing a nuke experiment, but with the cosmics or with the Xenium, those panels are, are largely defined. Uh, so how do you see kind of the trade-off going from genome-wide to targeted or something in between? Yeah, even for target, I I think my um my my genomics core staff uh, asked me the same question. Um, yeah, I I think first of all, I I I think nano is making the panel bigger and bigger, and to some degree, there's there's no need to do even bigger, right? <laughs> and so now they're gonna offer the six thousand gene panel. Uh, I would not be surprised. Maybe in two years, they're gonna offer that twenty thousand gene panel, which actually covers entire uh, uh, transcriptome of human or mice. And so so in that case, you do get some level of genome-wise of, if you're talking about the, the two different fields that really kind of converge, uh, that, that's probably in a moment you, you'll see, oh, although you are doing targeted, uh, but you actually get a pretty good genome-wide coverage. Um, but but that's not one, um, but, um, but you are you are not really sequencing base by base, right? Sometimes you you still don't have that discovery power in terms of uh, kind of kind of single base mutation and uh, isoforms and the RNA modification and so on and so forth. Uh, so so the discovery is not just a um, not just a gene expression cell type, but a lot of interesting RNA biology, DNA biology. You you, you probably still have to go back to the to the base by base sequencing. Um, so whether or not you can actually perform both on uh, exactly the same tissue, that that would be the best. Uh, but even if you can now, I would say zero tissue, you have two two different modalities, two different data sets. And uh, I know computational folks like yourself, Hagen, and <laughs> you, you, you'll be super excited about that. And and uh, and uh, for most of the people, that's a challenge, that's a problem, but for you, that's an opportunity, I believe. Um, you can really kind of combine, integrate data to to understand way better the, the mechanisms. Um, yeah. So following up on that, uh, what are the new computational sort of tools that we want to have and the new experimental tools that we would want to have? Uh, yeah, actually, it's a better question for Hogger. <laughs> and so, I, I, I think, a, I think an integration, uh, a integration across samples and integration across modalities. Um, I, I think in the past well, two years, I think in Nature Method added okay, the most crowded computational method development field is a, a deconvolution or decomposition. Um, but probably next year or two years, uh, most of the crowd are going to be, yeah, kind of multimodality data integration tools. Uh, although that's going to be very crowded, but that means that's really urgent, 
urgent need and a and a huge impact that type of tool are gonna gonna generate. And then looking more towards kind of clinical application, do you think it's kind of multimodal would be the future or it would be in the end focused on a single feature that is most informative for patient outcome prediction, for example? Yeah, maybe for, for a while and for um, a while, yeah. you guys work on, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm interested in uh, the pathology perspective too, but I think clinically the stuff that will be adopted, it, the simpler, the better, right? So there's obviously goals of translating all this high-plex information into, you know, uh, analysis of h &E or, you know, even like nuclear morphology analysis, like how much, how much of the information that we unlock with uh, the, you know, these spatial omics technologies can be then captured, you know, with that knowledge um, in simpler readouts. So I guess my bias is that, you know, um, I do think in some ways spatial technology may be more easily adoptable because it, it fits some of what clinicians are used to a little bit more looking at tissue and tumor board and things like that versus even something like single cell, right, which um, has not really been adopted, right, for, for assays in the clinic um, to date. Um, but yeah, so I, I, I feel like um, the research side will continue to push uh, more multi-omics and increasing the understanding, but I think before it really makes it um, into the translational realm um, in any large way, I would, I would hope or predict that it would get simplified um, to, to, you know, a, a simpler and more resourceful assay. But I'm curious what others think. <laughs> Yeah, maybe I can just like weigh in on that as well. I think the other panelists have given like super nice answers so far. And one additional thing that I think could be of like really high relevance and importance is to build like these common coordinate frameworks for spatial data spe specifically, where you can sort of like compare different regions and make sure that you're actually comparing like similar locations within different patients or whether it's like different blocks or like from different yeah, use like different samples essentially, because otherwise you can like losing this idea of like having spatial data and you can only make a comparison within the reference sample that you're using. But now since we start to gather more and more samples and data and so like using the context of the human cell atlas, uh, if we could actually start to sort of like reference them to a common corner framework or like some sort of reference at least, I think that could be of a huge importance and we can start to make more of these contrastive analysis and uh, yeah, try, sort of like gather a lot of like important insights from that. And it's gonna like require a lot of efforts, but to me that's like one of the actually most essential uh, computational methods that we still haven't found like a super good solution to right now at least even though there are some really cool attempts and efforts uh, out there yeah i mean what alma's saying is really fundamental because currently when we think about companion diagnostics um or any sort of risk assessment um you know pathology is really an observation an observation of spatial relationships you know an h and &E slide you look at it and then you make a risk assessment based on what you see um and that risk assessment is usually a diagnostic label right um and the spatial transcriptomic and spatial proteomic tools um especially if we're able to do it what alma is suggesting would then just expand what we're already doing which is looking closer into spatial relationships and spatial observations. Um, the bigger jump to me is not, we're not going to be doing these technologies at scale on clinical specimens for risk assessment community diagnostics, but we could be saying this observation that we make, can we then trans, can we then use that and deploy that using digital pathology, using algorithms, using other sorts of modalities on um, the tools that we already have, like an HD slide, for example. And I think that that is what I'm particularly quite excited about. But, but what do you think are the additional barriers to implement that in a digital pathology setting? So it's it's a let's assume the technology is ready and there are computational tools that would be able to dig. So is it cost? Is it kind of yeah, it's, it's, what is um, needed to convince? Yeah, that, that's really complicated. There's there's a lot of different aspects to that. I'm I'm personally an optimist and feel that we will get there eventually. But it's I think it's it's something that we could have an entire forum over the challenges and in, in digital pathology and companion diagnostics, those sorts of things. Do we have more questions in the in the chat? If not, I would ask another because from personal experience, the different techniques have different areas of, of 
profiling, right? So there's some that are very much focused on smaller areas and I might you touched that in your talk. So do you see that as a strong limitation for research, for clinical research, uh, having a too small area to be profiled, uh, even with a larger set of, of features like for a transcriptome? I think it's a super good question. And uh, it's a question that we tend to like revisit quite often in our analysis. Like, for example, if you try to make these sort of like causal analysis, right? Like whether it's like a certain signal is present or like uh, it's like emerges in the presence or absence of like say a spatial pattern or a certain cell type. Uh, could you actually say that that cell type is present or absent if you just captured like a smaller piece of the region? Like maybe it's like in the vicinity, it is like slightly outside that field of view. And I think the only way to sort of like address this is to collect like enough uh, data, right? Like as Sandy sort of like mentioned in her talk about sort of like the spatial power analysis, like if you could somehow estimate like the number of samples that you require in order to answer these answers, you just like need to aim for like gathering enough and sufficient amounts of data. And we can't really be always like super sure about it, but sometimes having like diversity for certain aspects, at least of your analysis, the diversity from multiple different samples or multiple regions is like maybe more important than having just like one single large field of view or like one single host slide image. Uh, so I really think it depends on your research questions and um, in the paper that sort of like relates to what's on the presented on. I think they show that depending on whether it's like cells and adjacencies or it's like presence or absence of certain cell types, it, it differs whether it's beneficial to have like a large field of view or like a multiple smaller field of view. So a super good question. I think we should actually pay more attention to this like in our experimental designs because uh, it's quite important to make the right inferences. Well, I don't know, I can kind of follow up with a little bit of my my own experience or my perspective um so i think you guys also mentioned that uh, ccf common coordinated framework uh oftentimes that uh, uh refers to kind of anatomic uh ccf right uh, but on the other hand um i i think uh, in particular it's the a the human cell actors after uh I think we're producing the single cell. I, I think that's sort of like a single cell CCF, right? So every single organ, you have tons of those single cell sequence. Uh, so now, no matter what data you look at from one modality, you always map to that single cell reference data, which serves as your CCF. Now, anatomic CCF, but single cell CCF. I, I think that can help a lot, even though you map out very, very small area and and uh, for different patients, different uh, regions, and uh, that area might vary a lot uh, from sample to sample, but eventually when you map to the CCF, the single cell CCF, you're going to get the right answer. And and even very different modalities, um, I, I saw some paper that called kind of wake link data integration and a uh, on like a 20 different protein markers and a, a computational, you can integrate that with the genome-wide single cell reference data. So I think that is becoming possible and the people are making progress. I, I feel that might be the best way in the future to understand whatever single cell and, and omics data, in particular in a clinical setting, because no matter where you map that, that tumor, you just map to the CCF, whatever, kind of you measured that, that ratio of tumor is just mapped to the single cell CCF, not anatomic CCF. Thank you uh, everyone for the great uh, panel discussion. And I'll turn it back to Ellen, which uh, has, she has some uh, messages for us. Thanks Ellen. Thank you yes. to all the speakers and, and panelists again for a wonderful talk and panel discussion. Yeah, and thanks everyone for joining us today. We will post this on YouTube and Bilibili in several days, and we hope you can join us for other upcoming events um, at the Human Cell Atlas, and stay tuned.